Well, uh, we're starting a series today on the Lord's Prayer, and so we're going to get stuck into that. And I hope this is a blessing to you, and I hope that it helps you and equips you in your own prayer life. Uh, so let's pray, and then we'll get stuck in. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we thank you that you've given us the privilege of approaching you in prayer, and we thank you for the Lord's Prayer and the gift that it is to us. I pray that as I talk about it this morning, that your Holy Spirit might speak to each one of us and that we might be more bold in coming before the throne of God. In Jesus' name, Amen. When I was in uh, year five, I first started the journey of um, trying to learn the guitar. And the first teacher that I went into, I, I really wanted to be, I was into heavy metal and I wanted to be a heavy metal guitar player. And the first so I bought myself a black electric guitar, it looked pretty heavy metal. And the first teacher that I had, I just rang from the yellow pages and went and saw this random gentleman that I'd never met. And uh, he was an elderly guy with a stumpy finger who was into country music. He'd, he'd lost half of his pinky and his, his, when he was playing, his half finger would fall awkwardly on the fretboard and make a funny sound. And, He'd been teaching clearly for a long time and he'd kind of lost patience for it, to be honest. And so it wasn't long before his, his impatience and my failure to practice collided to such a degree as I decided maybe it was time to find a new teacher. So I got to another teacher. I rang around and found another one. And this one, when I arrived, he looked a lot more like the teacher that might be to my liking. He had long hair and he and he played a mean guitar and when I walked in and sat down he started playing and he was an amazing player and I, was, I started to really hope you know this this guy's going to teach me what I need to know um, sadly though he was more interested in playing and having me watch than teaching me how to play and so a large part of my lesson was listening to him play and then have him at the end of the lesson say any riffs you want to learn and he left me with kind of nothing to really work with and build a base from to be a great student. In one sense, in those early days at least, I can account for some of my lack ability of ability as a guitar player uh, because of I had poor teachers, you know, I had poor teachers. Um, but when we approach the life of prayer, which I believe is something that we can learn uh, we can't claim as Christians that we have poor teachers because Jesus himself taught his disciples how to pray. The Apostle Paul gives us wonderful examples of prayer. The Psalms are basically prayers. And so we have this rich kind of resource of teaching and instruction and model that we can draw from in our prayer life. And so we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer, the one Jesus gave his disciples in answer to the question, teach us to pray, Lord, you know? And uh, he gave them the Lord's Prayer. And it was for the disciples to utilize and think about. So we want to park ourselves there, kind of one line at a time, and week by week go through this and see if God can awaken something within us and that we might call on his name and utilize his teaching to inform the way in which we pray. For many of us, prayer is a difficult thing, you know. Uh, we find it hard, and I've met a few people now, pastorally speaking, who never can pray in public because they're really self-conscious about their own prayer life. And there's people, I guess, that are frustrated about prayer in their own personal lives. And so for many of us, it's a struggle. It's something that doesn't come easy to us. Um, but the good news is that Jesus instructs, Jesus teaches us and gives us models. Um, the other thing I want to say about this is on Wednesdays, we're looking at prayers from Paul. And you can learn from Wednesdays in the Word about different prayers that Paul prayed and what they teach us about God's kingdom and how to pray. Uh, but each Sunday in this series, we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer. So... Uh, one of the things that we should be thinking at this time is, you know, transformation is, is not just about information. Transformation is more than information. So I'm going to be teaching you about the Lord's Prayer, but my desire isn't for you to, to know more stuff or for us to know more stuff. You probably know much of what I'm going to say to you. 
are my desire is for a transformed practice. You know, James said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. So as we tackle this series, perhaps it's good for us to think about our own prayer practice. And maybe if we haven't got a regular prayer practice, to, to try something during this coming month or so, to experiment with different options and say, these are the times I'm going to meet with God and this is going to be the shape of that time. So don't just listen to the word, kind of do what it says is what I want to say there. So let's begin with this little phrase from Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. The Bible reading was from Luke chapter 11, but we're going to look at the version in Matthew chapter 6. And it starts like then, this, sorry, this then is how you should pray, our Father, this then. So what do these two words mean? These two words point us backwards, you know? They're kind of like therefore. Uh, Jesus clearly said something before this moment that he's pointing back towards and wanting us to refer to. So he looks back and he says, and he was been teaching a, about prayer. And he's been saying to people, you know, when you pray, don't just... Um, don't just mount up lots, lots of empty phrases. Don't go on babbling and think you'll be heard because of your many words. You know, there's kind of movements all around the world for extended prayer times, isn't there? And I don't want to belittle those. I think there is a place for that. But it's worth thinking about that Jesus says he, you don't have to twist God's arm by longevity in your prayers, you know? The weight of words, the volume of words, it's not as if God um, kind of starts to listen when you turn over the first hour mark into the second hour, you know. Uh, he, he's not like that. Actually, he just wants us to come. And, and Jesus actually says prior to this moment, he says, Jesus, the Father already knows what you need before you ask him. Which raises other questions for us then. Why should we ask? And that's probably a question you could chat over morning tea. Why, why should we ask if God always already knows? That's worth discussing and thinking about. But I'm going to move on to talk about the prayer itself. So Jesus, uh, Matthew tells us, says, This then is how you should pray. What does he mean by this then is how you should pray? It seems simple enough, but what does he mean? Does he actually mean that we should take the Lord's Prayer verbatim and pick it up and when we need to pray, use those words that Jesus gave us uh, to articulate our thoughts to God? Well, the answer to that question is, there's a lot worse things you could do, right? There's a lot worse things that you could do in prayer than to kneel beside your bed each morning and open your Bible and recite the Lord's Prayer. That's probably a good place to start, particularly if you don't know what to pray for. Just reading the prayer verbatim and trying to engage your heart. Now, it's true, if you did that day after day, it would become increasingly difficult to put your heart into it, but it's a, it's a constructive way to pray. And in my own life, if I ever come across a thing that I'm unsure how to pray about, you know what I often do? I often just pray the Lord's Prayer. When I can't find words of my own, I pray the Lord's Prayer. So that's one valid use of this prayer, but um, maybe what... Jesus has in mind it's not necessarily just using it verbatim but riffing off it you know using it as a scaffold to teach you how to pray this was a, a method that Martin Luther the great reformer loved to use he would open the scriptures he would read a passage and he would pray it and he did this a lot with the Lord's Prayer in his prayer time and he he, he, he just saw this as a good way of aligning his dreams, his thoughts, his prayers, his utterances with the purposes of God. You know, if you're following along, being scaffolded by the Lord's Prayer, then, you know, you're probably doing all right. You're probably staying on track. You're probably uh, asking for the kinds of things that God would have you ask for. So... In answer to the question, what, what do we do with this prayer in the first instance? Well, you can use it verbatim or you could use it as a scaffold. It can have benefit using it either way. Bit of traffic about. <laughs> 
Well, the first phrase of the prayer is this one, and this is really significant. And this is what I'll focus on, because our focus is on the content of the actual prayer. So the first phrase of the prayer is, Our Father. Now, the first thing we notice about that is that first word is a plural word. It's not my, it's our. And I think Jesus is instructing us that you know, we, we ought to remember that prayer can be a communal exercise, that we can gather with other people. And we, even if it isn't a communal exercise in that case, uh, we can appreciate that it's an expression of being part of a family of God's people. So we're mindful that I'm not the only child. There's lots of children of God. And we say, ow. And that second word is Father. Father. You know, at the kind of foundation of what it means to pray as a Christian is this burning conviction that God is our Father and we are His children. Prayer in God's economy for the Christian is an act of intimacy and communion with God. It's about drawing near to someone who cares as deeply for you as a father does. You know, God is not a distant deity who's disinterested and has to be manipulated by our performance. He's a father who cares and loves his children deeply and wants the best for them. Now, it's worth noting here that this is a prayer for disciples. And that's why it starts, Our Father, because becoming a child of God involves putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's only then that we come into sonship, into the family of God. And so John says it this way, Yet to all who did receive him, to those that believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor a human decision, a husband's will, but born of God. John 1, 12 and 13. That's the privilege of Christian prayer. It's intimate communion with a heavenly Father. The second uh, kind of text that points in this direction is from the Apostle Paul who says this in Galatians 4, 6. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts so that we can cry, Abba, Father. So what I'm saying today to you uh, through this prayer is that God invites us as his children to come as children knowing that we have a good father who cares deeply for us. You know, I'm a father. I'm a father of three children. And I, one of the, my goals as a parent that I have for my parenting years when my kids are little and really dependent upon me is I want them to always know that their dad is willing and ready and waiting to listen should they have a problem. You know, I, I understand that there'll be times where they go to other people for that and there's other people that they might see as, you know, more fitting for that. But I want to be available. I want to be ready. And if they choose to come, I want to communicate to them that I'll always hear them out, that I'll always listen, and I'll always do that with the best possible intentions, I hope. And that's true of me. And I'm flawed and sinful and selfish. God is a father. But he's not like me in that sense. He is perfect in love. And so we are invited, friends, by the grace of God to come into the presence of God with all our weakness and vulnerability and say, Father, help. Father, help. I need you. Now, there's two things involved, I guess, in seeing God as our Father. The first is... You know, when my, when my kids were really little, they used to think I was invincible because I was their dad. They used to think that I could conquer all things. Now they're a bit older, they know that that's very false. But they had this perception of their father that he was big and capable and there for them. You know, it's so much more true of our God. You know, we can look to him with some reverence and awe and wonder uh, but also with intimacy because of who he is. 
The other part of this equation is that we can come to him with all our brokenness and weakness. You know, some things in life, maturing and growing up, means becoming self-dependent and reliable and present well, be strong. But in our prayer life, it's almost as if the reverse is true. In our prayer life, maturity looks like dependence. Maturity looks like recognizing, I don't have what it takes, but I need the Father's intervention in my life and my situation. So I want to encourage you to approach God as your Father. And do so knowing that He wants to commune with you. He wants you to come in close. And He wants to deal with you with tenderness and compassion. That is who He is. The last thing I want to say about this opening statement is that it's an invitation to awe and wonder. The reason why I picked Matthew 6, 9 over Luke 11 is that in Matthew's version, he has this phrase, Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Whilst I think that the revelation of God as Father demands that we come into the God's presence with expectation of intimacy and connection, it's also true that this God that we serve is in heaven. There's something other about him. So we have this call that he gives us to come close to him and call him dad, to acknowledge his care for us as his children. But we also are mindful of the fact that he's not our friend, he's not our mate, He's the ruler of the universe. There's something glorious and transcendent and other in him. You know, in theological speak, uh, the two ways of thinking about God is in his imminence and in his transcendence. The imminence part of the equation is what we've just been talking about. God as our Father. He comes near to us. The transcendence is the acknowledgement that God is other and awesome, that he's the creator. I want you to think about that. That's important, you know. If we're going to understand prayer, then we need to understand it is who it is we're praying to. So who is this God in heaven? Who is he? Who's the one we approach and get to call dad? Well, this is who he is. He's the one that, remember Moses asked to see the Lord and the Lord said, you can pa- I'll pass by and I'll show you my back through the cleft of the rock. I won't show you anymore because I'm too glorious and you will die. (laughs) That's who this God is. He's the one who spoke creation into being. He's the one before whom the creatures in Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 6 fell down in awe and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He's the one who tore through the Red Sea and pulled it asunder so that Israel could go through. He's the God in Isaiah 40 who holds the oceans of his hand, uh, oceans of the world in the palm of his hand and holds the mountains of the world in it like a drop in the bucket. This is an awesome God. And he invites us to call him Father. You know, the Bible, uh, Theologians sometimes use these words to describe God. Just to give you a bigger picture of God, uh, they say that God is omniscient. That means he knows everything. They say that God is omnipresent, which means he is everywhere. They say that God is omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. These are statements of the transcendent awesomeness of God. He is our Father, yes, but He is in heaven. You know, um, sometimes I've heard this happen around Cliff, uh, a member of our church. Um, Someone will say something like, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this question, you know, and they come up with something that's kind of rattling around in their spirit. And I know what Cliff's going to say next if he's around. No, you won't, you know. You'll be too busy flat on your face worshipping God. And he's right about that. He's right about that. God is awesome. And in his presence, his people bow in wonder and awe. Look, I'm, I'm as I said, a dad of three kids. 
And sometimes, as a parent, I become conscious of my own inadequacy, my inability. You know, when, particularly when your kids are sick or unwell, and you kind of look at them in their, their littleness, <laughs> and you think to yourself, ah, oh, if only I could help them, you know, they seem so vulnerable when they're going through hard things, and you feel, feel really powerless. You know, I was having one of those moments this week. My, my daughter Grace has had some problems with her ear and I was sitting on the bed in my bedroom just thinking about that and thinking about what it meant for her and it, it made me really sad and really upset that I couldn't do anything. And I was thinking maybe there was something we could do, you know, maybe we could have helped in some way if we got in earlier or something. And you know, I was expressing this regret and pain to my wife and just saying, oh, I'm just so upset about this, I feel so hopeless. And you know, my wife being who she is, she was fairly direct. She said, why are you doing this to yourself? <laughs> why are you doing this to yourself? This is out of your control. This is, this is God's domain now. And she said, you can't do anything. You, we've just got to accept it. We've just got to leave it in God's hands. We can't worry about it. We've just got to pray about it. And we've got to know that He is the God who can make things happen. We don't know what will happen, but we can't do anything. We're totally dependent on Him. That was a good word and a good reminder to this dad. So what am I saying? What does it mean for us to approach God as our Father in heaven. Well, friends, it means that we can come with expectation. Expectation and wonder. That means, of course, if we acknowledge that God is bigger than us, more powerful than us, that He knows everything, that means sometimes when we come into His presence and we ask Him as our Father in heaven, He won't act in ways that we expect. He might delay longer than we expect. He might say no. He might do something different. But that's because He's God and we're not. And so He invites us just to trust in Him, to recognize His power. But this idea that God is in heaven also means that there's nothing his arms are too small to accomplish. There's nothing that is impossible for God. And so, friends, come with all your hopes and dreams. Come with all your prayers. Come into the presence of Almighty God. Know that he is your Father. But know also that he is glorious and majestic. And he could do all things. So come with faith and expectancy into the presence of God. That's God's will for you. Well, that's all I've got to say about that for the time being. But I hope it's given you a taste of what we're going to come into as we approach the Lord's Prayer. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, bless these people and encourage them in their prayer lives. Help us to see you as our Heavenly Father. Help us to see you as the one who is capable of more than we ask or imagine. And give us boldness and courage to come into the presence of God wholeheartedly, seeking your blessing on our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Go in peace.